Well, good morning. I'll just uh, open with prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. This day, when those, those years ago you came to earth and died, were buried, but then came back to life. Thank you. Thank you that you overcame death for us, Lord. And I pray that we can rejoice in that this morning. I pray that we can hear the gospel. The gospel is as fresh today as it ever has been. Please, I pray for your Holy Spirit to be with me so that I preach it faithfully. In Jesus' name, Amen. So, um, I would like to just go back, take you back, <clears throat> around 2,000 years. We've rejoiced, haven't we, about the resurrection. But just imagine, those 2,000 years ago, if you were actually a follower of Jesus. Imagine that you are also alongside Peter, uh, James, and John. You've gone into hiding following the death of Jesus. The Messiah who you confidently thought would outwit his enemies has been caught and he's been shamefully tortured and crucified. The Jesus movement, so to speak, well, it seems to be over. And perhaps whilst you're in hiding, you remember, because you were there at the crucifixion, you remember what was said, you hear the taunts of the spectators who mocked Jesus, who even said, come down off the cross and save yourself. He saved others, but he cannot even save himself. He cannot even save himself. Supposed to be God in the flesh, giver of life, and yet he lies dead in a tomb. Well, that was Friday, but here we are on Sunday. Yes, you're deflated. You might even be thinking of going back home, forgetting the whole sorry mess. But then suddenly, news reaches you. News that another follower of Jesus, a woman called Mary Magdalene, has been to the tomb and discovered that the tomb is empty. Let's pick up the story at Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. And from verse 1. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. So there they go down to the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that you seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him. Lo, I have told you. Can you imagine hearing that news? Now, there might be part of you that says at the time, well, I'm still not convinced. But if you read on 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 6, after that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at once. You were there also. You saw him too. Maybe you even spoke to him. Well, okay, for a moment, let's just step out of the story, out of that account. And just think for a moment, if you're not a believer, if today you've come, you're hearing this message, but you're still not convinced 
that there's all that much to this story. I mean, what is it about Christians? Why is it they get so excited about the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Even if I grant you that this man Jesus died, and that somehow, in some unusual, special, miraculous even way, he came back to life, what difference does that make to me? And that's what people ask. How is that going to get me out of debt? How is that going to get me a living wage? How will the resurrection fix my marriage that's failing? How will a 2,000 year old story repair my traumatic upbringing, my addiction, my depression, my sickness? How is that relevant to me now, 2,000 years ago? A message about a man who died and then came back to life. Well, firstly, I want to say to you, it's fashionable in this day and age to be cynical. It's the fashion to sneer. So if that is your starting point, as you hear this message, then I'm afraid it's probably going to fall on deaf ears. There's no room for cynicism. What we need is an open heart, somebody that's really looking for truth. So is it your heartfelt question when you ask, where is God in my life? Do you really want to know the answer to that question? Well, if you do, good. Because I believe that you're just like one of his followers. Standing at the empty tomb, yet to understand the cosmic, infinite significance of what you are witnessing. Now what is that? What is it that you're witnessing that you don't quite get? What is the mystery that eludes much of mankind? Well, I could go into a spiel now, like the politicians do, and try and spin this and, and move you emotionally. Ah, oh, the Lord Jesus. I'm not going to do that. Let me just tell you how it is in Scripture. What the Bible says about this man, Jesus, and what he has done for you. You see, Christians believe that Jesus went into death and then overcame it, conquered death, that you might be set free, that you might be liberated from a slavery that maybe you don't even know you exist in, that you are slave to something. What is that? Well, it is a rather old-fashioned word to use this day, these days. The word is sin, and I'm going to talk about that a bit later, what sin is. But it's undeniable that every one of us is a victim of something. There are two things in life, we're told, that we all have to pay at some point. One is taxes, the famous politician said, and the other is, what happens? Death. That is inevitable. We are all headed towards death. If you don't believe that, then maybe you're not quite on this planet. Death is a certainty, just as that famous phrase, death and taxes, regarding death and taxes. Death comes to us all and none of us is getting any younger. Now what happened at the cross, what Jesus did through his resurrection, is simply this, that Jesus died so that you don't have to. Jesus resurrected himself to resurrect you. His new life can be your new life if you just believe. Your suffering, your pain, yes, all of that stuff that we mentioned before that you, you know, want the answer to, it does matter to God it matters so much that he paid a price for it. And that price was the death of his son. And the price 
is a payment not just to end your sicknesses and your diseases and your death, but to grant you something far greater. The knowledge of God, knowing Him, knowing His Son, and the gift of eternal life. Now let me just prove that by scripture. If we go to John chapter 5, uh, verses 28 and 29. I've said it to you straightforwardly. The death and burial and the resurrection of Jesus brings about hope and life to you also. And so in 28 and 29 of chapter 5, Jesus says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Notice those that already know the Lord Jesus, that have been saved by him, in verse 29, because they've done good, they come out to a resurrection of life. But those that have done evil, the resurrection of damnation. Now isn't that interesting, evil? Okay, you might not like the, the word sin. You might think to yourself, that is an archaic word. Fair enough. Replace it with what you know in your heart exists around you, even in you. You know that people make mistakes. You know that people do wrong. You know that people can be bad. You know that people can harm. You know that there is evil. That is sin or symptomatic of sin. And it's sin, interestingly enough, that causes, that results in our death. It's that power in us that harms not just others, but ourselves, our being, that it eats away at us until eventually, Romans chapter 5 verse 12, death. We go down into death. It's a slow killer. That's what sin is. Okay, so you still not convinced. I'm quite a good person. I do good. I'm a nice person. People like me. I don't cause any harm. I have good friends. I'm a decent chap, woman. Really? Let's just look at what sin looks like. Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1, the problem with sin is that it obscures your vision. It's like someone coming along and throwing dust in your eyes. And you can't see. You're scratching away. And you can't see the, the, the reality, the truth. This is what sin looks like, Romans chapter 1. And even as they did not like, verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not Convenient, that is, things that are not fitting or proper. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, 
covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. If you pick up a newspaper, it's exactly what you're reading, isn't it? That's exactly what's going on in society. We are members of society also. And when we look into this mirror of God's word, we find what coming back at us. Oh dear. Oh dear, there's a bit of me here. I started out reading about fornication and wickedness and I thought, no, that's not too bad. But then I started reading about envy and deceit and backbiting. And then I read about being proud. And then I thought, hmm, boasting, showing off. Look at me with my fancy car, my big home. I've done it. I'm guilty. That is me. Even if it's just one of them, it is me. Unmerciful. Yes, I still haven't forgiven my parents. Disobedient to parents even. Even children can get this. That is sin. That's what it looks like. And those who believe that they're good enough, well, they're deluding themselves. But here is the good news. Before we get too sorrowful about this, and we think, oh, there's no way out. Here is the good news. That defying our expectations, Jesus loves the sinner and the guilty and the unlovable, so to speak. And he's made a way out. A way in which you can step out of death and into life. A way of not facing what is the ultimate. Do you recall? Some will come out to life, but some will come out to damnation. Jesus, the giver of life, says there's a day on which he will judge both the living and the dead. God is perfectly just and he cannot let wrongs go unpunished. Now people recoil at that and they think, oh no, you know, why can't God just forgive? Well, he has through Jesus, but he's perfectly good, unlike the judges of this world, on the one hand, he's not a stern, unforgiving judge. <coughs> Send them down. <laughs> Nor is he a judge that can plea bargain, that can take a backhander. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. No, God is perfectly good, he's perfectly just, he doesn't wink at breaking the law. He doesn't take backhanders because he can't. He cannot. Because he's so perfectly good. When you see it like that, you see, wow, that's a God. That's, that's really God. His standard is so utterly and infinitely perfect. that yes, the Stalins and the Hitlers don't get away with it. They don't. He is the judge of all. The liars, the thieves, the drunkards, the chiefs, they don't get away with it. They don't get away with it. He judges them all. But he judges the big and the small. The big sins and the little sins. And those include ours. But in that ultimate act of sacrifice, what happened? 
is that Jesus Christ bore all of those injustices, all of those sins, all of those wrongs, all of the, 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 the pain and hurt of the rejected and the addicted and even of the most heinous, wretched evils of humankind that you can think of. He died bearing all of that, taking that hell so that we might be freed from that dreadful fate. So that we might be brought into his kingdom of love and peace. And it took God to do that for us. We couldn't reach out and do it ourselves. What God did in the ultimate act of love was to come down to us as a mere man. And in Christ Jesus, bear the sins. In agony. We don't really know what happened. We don't quite understand what happened at Calvary. That crucifixion. That agony that Jesus came to where he cried out, My God, why have you forsaken me? But he took on the punishment of all of us. And it went on and on until eventually he died. And he said, This, it is, it is finished. And then he came through. He came back. And he said, here I am. I've done it. Can you believe it? Even the disciples themselves didn't quite get it. They said, Jesus, are you going to restore Israel now? Are you going to take up arms maybe and overthrow the Romans? But it wasn't the Roman kingdom that was the problem. It's not the United Kingdom that's the problem. If you're thinking that your vote at the election is going to solve all your problems. No. The root issue is sin. That which separates us from God and has to be judged and paid for. But the payment has been made by Jesus Christ. All we have to do is receive it, appropriate it. By faith, by trusting in that, by turning to him and saying, yes, I accept your free gift, your salvation, paid for me in blood. Resurrection Sunday is proof that he did that, that he's won the victory over death, that he came back to say, I've paid your debts, I've won you your life, just believe and I'll give you your freedom. The ultimate freedom. That is the message that spread like wildfire. And no internet, no royal mail, no parcel force, but it changed the course of history. And today, 2.2 billion claim that Jesus is their saviour. The question for you this morning is, is he yours? Is he yours? Do you know him also? Has he saved you from your sins? We'll finish that. Should we say a prayer? <clears throat> Lord, thank you for the good news. Thank you for the gospel. Lord, thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, if there be any here today who do not know you, Lord, please grant them repentance and faith. Lord, we come to you knowing that we are sinners, knowing that there's nothing that we can bring that can earn our salvation. There's nothing that we can do, but it had to be done by you, Lord. And in your great love, you came down to earth and took the penalty for us. Lord, the gospel really is as simple as that, and yet it is so profound. And Lord, we simply come to you in faith and say, yes, Lord Jesus, be our Saviour. Please be our Lord. Take our lives. 
we surrender to you, to your will, and pray for the forgiveness of our sins, that we might have a new life in you, that we too might be resurrected, raised to life, just as you were. Help us be part of that historic moment where we're changed from death unto life, transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. I pray please for an unction of your Holy Spirit to be with us. Even as Christians, if we've been serving you for many years, Lord, and we've reached a point where we really want to change, we recognize that it's not the way it was before, when our love was, was burning hot, please reignite us, Lord. Bring us to you, Lord. Help us to surrender, to totally yield. And I pray that you truly become Lord of our life. I pray thank you, Lord, for today and for every day and for an eternity that can be ours in you. And I pray in Jesus' name, our King and Saviour. Amen.